insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment. This is episode 122. Smells Like Treasures, Tributes, and Resurrections. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my creative and talented co-host, Michelle Whalen. Hi, everyone. How are you doing today, dear? Tired. How are you? Tired. You're always tired when we do these <laughs> in the evening, aren't you? No, I'm tired because I was in the office today. Oh, the evil office. The evil office. That's not the good. evil flume. I but know, it's, it is rough being in the office two days a week, isn't it? Shush. My goodness. I don't know how the rest of the world survives five days in the office. No, wait, I do, because that's what I do. Mm-hmm. Don't be bitter. Yeah, just a little bit. Yeah, well. Anyway. Anyway, I bet that's not what we're talking about today, is it? That is not what we're talking <laughs> about today. Today, in our Disney detective, Walt Disney's personal plane remains abandoned at Disney World. And Imagineer Raleigh Crump, we get his thoughts on the Museum of the Weird, the scariest Disneyland attraction ever envisioned, unfortunately not realized, though. Mm. Then in our Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy, we finally learn how Palpatine survived and returned in Rise of Skywalker. What we don't figure out is why. Because mm. I still am puzzled why they did that. But anyway, <laughs> we also talk about uh, that uh, Andor, the Star Wars show uh, about Cassian Andor, who was featured in Rogue One, uh, reportedly has wrapped filming. So hopefully we should be seeing that soon. That's another one that I wonder why they made that, because I'm not really sure a backstory was needed. But hey, you know what? That seems to be what we're doing these days. We kill off characters and then give them a backstory. <laughs> And as always, oh, oh and for no. our entertainment, we do have entertainment news. We do. This is an entertainment podcast. So for our entertainment news, we'll talk about Nirvana being sued by the baby from Nevermind's album cover. And sadly, drummer Charlie Watts of the Rolling Stones dies at 80. And then we'll finish up with our insightful picks of the week. Kind of an oddball one I had this week. Yeah. Kind of very sp- Unusual for you. Yeah, scraping kind of. the bottom of the barrel right now. <laughs> I haven't been watching all that much. Oh. And then, uh, well, not enough to steal thoughts. from me. Is no, that? you didn't give me anything good to steal from this week. <laughs> I've, I've been milking all yours the last couple of weeks. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so, well, you know, I admit that I'm an uncultured swine. See? Yeah, there you, you go. You expand my horizons. Aww. Now. Before we get into all of that, I would invite our audience to subscribe to the podcast. You can get audio versions of this podcast listed as insights into entertainment. You can also get video versions of this podcast and all of the network's podcasts listed as insights into things. Pretty much anywhere you get a podcast, Google, Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, Amazon, and so forth. I would also invite our audience to write in, give us some feedback. You can email us at comments at insights into things.com. You'll find us on Twitter at insights underscore things. Or Facebook.com slash Insights Into Things Podcast. We're also on Instagram at Instagram.com slash Insights Into Things. Where links to all of those and more can be found on our website at InsightsIntoThings.com. Shall we get into it? Let's do it. All right. Go for Disney Detective. So our first story comes from InsideTheMagic.net, and it talks about how Walt Disney's personal plane remains abandoned at Walt Disney World. So with the majority of Walt Disney World always looking magical, it's actually hard to imagine that there are sections 
that may look a little abandoned. With Walt Disney World being the size of San Francisco, there's plenty of room to place things that might not be unused. Uh, in the past, we've talked, uh, the, the website has actually talked about how there's an abandoned airport that was active on property for many years, uh, for a few years. Uh, there have also been, uh, you know, as, as most people know, there's a whole water park, river country, that w- has been empty for many years. And before Art of Disney uh, was built, the space was actually known to many guests as the Ghost Hotel. Uh, and we actually have plenty of pictures of that because when we had stayed at um, Pop, Century. Pop Century, we could see all of uh, the abandonment uh, of that. Uh, so now it seems that Walt Disney's personal airplane, um, uh, which he used to travel between Burbank and Orlando, is looking rather unattended to as well. So Walt's airplane currently sits in a service area north of Disney's Animal Kingdom. In a recent snapshot that was taken by photographer uh, Bio Reconstruct, uh, we see that the cover on the plane is starting to come apart, and this could be cause for some water that might be pooling in the aircraft's casing. Um, it seems like also part of the tail is exposed in the picture as well. So hopefully the exposed area of the covering hasn't caused too much damage to the plane's uh, exterior. Uh, but it seems that, you know, you you can't really get to it from most of the, the guest areas. Um, but the theme park architect had responded to a tweet with an interesting update on why the plane was moved and why it has not been moved since. So they had said that it was repainted when they started the Disney Hollywood Studios expansion. And at one point it was planned to be relocated to Glendale, but nobody wanted to fund the shipping cost. So then Disney opted uh, for it to go to a Florida air museum, but nobody took them up on it. Uh, and the inside of the plane is actually gutted, and that's where the plane has been since. So the interesting thing was this used to be visible on the back lot tour. Right. So back in the day, before all the different incarnations of Disney Hollywood Studio, when they actually had the back lot studio tour, yes, this was something that you could see while you were going around uh, the the boneyard, and it was uncovered too, so right. you could see it in all its you glory. You could see at the time. it, right? They still it still had Mickey Mouse on it. I think it said Disney on it. Um, so it it was very much obvious that it was you know the Disney plane, right? Um, so then I guess when they started, you know, making all the changes to Hollywood Studio, that's when they kind of moved around, did whatever, and it just never kind of found and, a and new I home. I remember when they were doing construction, there were there was uh, news articles, local mm-hmm. news articles where they were actually carting the plane down the road mm-hmm. in, in Disney. You actually had film of that. Okay, okay. Which was kind of interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, I mean, clearly it's a collector's item at this point in time. Oh, absolutely. It's never going to fly again. Right, you know. But it would be nice if they would clean it up and put it someplace where, you know, guests could could see it even. Yeah, where would you put that, though? Uh, well, they have 100 square acres. They- well, I know, but like... <laughs> Got plenty of room somewhere. Like, I don't know what theme because everything is themed in Disney. Where would this actually fit? You could put it in Disney Springs at that one restaurant. That's the the plane. The aviation. The one. aviation there one. There you go. Ha! Huh, see. Or turn it Problem into a solved. restaurant. Yeah, you could do that too. Kind of a cramped restaurant. Yeah, kind of, kind of, kind of snug. Yeah, but see, you could totally do. There you go. See, Disney. That. Listen to this podcast. We just gave you an. Excellent <laughs> we just gave idea. you a perfect, perfect plan for you know. There you go. What to do with it? You know where else you could probably put it? You could probably put it at Vero Beach. Oh yeah, because they've got plenty of land out there. You got the airport out there. You do have the airport out You've there. Got the museum out there, so right. that might be a good place at, at the airstrip out there at Vero Beach. Yeah, you could so. do that too. Anyway, 
Anyway. Um, so let's talk about the Museum of the Weird. So this article came from the uh, San Francisco Gate, and it talked about how Imagineer Roly Crump um, had helped to create the Museum of the Weird, which was going to be the scariest Disneyland attraction ever and obviously never came to be. So Walt Disney always knew that he wanted to have a spooky attraction at Disneyland, but beyond that, he didn't know what he wanted um, or what it would eventually, or that it would eventually become the Haunted Mansion. So in, sem- it, so in assembling the team tasked with conveying it, he paired legendary Imagineer Yale Gracie, who had pioneered many of the effects in Pirates of the Caribbean, with a younger Imagineer, Roly Crump, who was newer to the team, but who had caught Disney's attention with his innovations working in the animation studio. He had said, we weren't really given too much direction on the project. Um, Crump, who was one of the, who is one of the last I'm sorry, who is the last living original haunted magi- haunted mansion imagineer, say that five, ta- five times fast, uh, who then later designed uh, attractions like the Enchanted Tiki Room and parts of Epcot, wrote in his memoirs, it's kind of a cute story. He said at the time, they still really didn't know what they wanted it to be. He also added in his book that they just kind of set us loose. Walt just wanted us to be left alone and gave us the freedom to do whatever we wanted. We had our own little studio that we just filled with all sorts of crazy stuff. What is interesting is that in the Haunted Mansion episode of Beyond the Attraction, he goes and and talks about this part of the story where um, they had, you know, they had come up with much scarier things for the the attraction so much so that they actually scared the custodians at wed enterprises um and that there were custodians that refused to go into their work area at night because things were were so scary um so they had just a lot of fun creating it um but then what ended up happening was while they were planning all of this then you had the <coughs> you had the World's Fair, the New York World's Fair come into play. So then what they ended up doing was transferring a whole bunch of the Imagineers from the park attractions over to that to work on that. And then after the World's Fair was done, then they moved them back to the park projects. But then, unfortunately... Walt Disney had passed away before the project could actually come to fruition. So they had all these ideas because what they wanted was they wanted to do an attraction, but then they wanted to do this walkthrough museum. So there were all of these great ideas that Rolly Crump had for the museum part of it that unfortunately after Walt died, the next people that came in basically said, we need it to be something that's family friendly we don't want it to be something that's so scary so unfortunately a lot of roly crump's ideas kind of went to you know the the wayside um but there are some little aspects of the haunted mansion that were inspirations from roly crump but what is nice about it is that now um you know there are so many haunted mansion fans out there that all of us, I should say, you know, are trying to find out as much information about the history behind it. And what's really cool is that right now there's an exhibit that is inside the Great Moments with Lincoln building on Main Street in Disneyland that is celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Haunted Mansion. Um, and they have a lot of the early concept artwork of the ride, including his original drawings. Um, so it's nice to see that some of that stuff is still out there for uh, fans to, to find and look for. Yeah. And Raleigh is one of our favorite mm-hmm. imaginers just because he's, he's so enthusiastic. You go back Absolutely. and you look at some of the interviews that he's done. And, and the work that he's done, mm-hmm. and he's incredibly talented, and it's stuff that you – it's so original. Abs- like, even to this day, absolutely. it looks 
Like it could be modern stuff right. from today, not fifty or sixty years ago when he, you know, first did some of the right. You see a, a piece of his work and you immediately recognize yes. what it is, right? Um, and his his, I don't know, like he, the way he recalls his stories of working with Walt mm-hmm. and and just. Not that he idolized Walt, but how much he loved his job because, Mm -hmm. you know, in in one quote he even says, you know, it's not like you work for Walt. You worked with Walt. Mm -hmm. And and he always gets choked up when he talks about Walt because you can see how much love he had for Mm -hmm. the man. Yeah. Even Um, all these years later, you know. Well, and and the article goes on to talk about the dedication he gets with his Main Street Mm -hmm. Um you know, the legends windows right, on right. Main Street where most legends get a window in one of the shops on Main Street and Rolly got an entire building dedicated to him with a nod to his work with, with Walt as well. Uh, so it was uh, kind, of, kind of a cool mm-hmm. kind of a cool story. And unfortunately, because the other Imagineers were so against having a scary haunted mansion, right? When, once Walt passed away... They all kind of shelved the whole thing. In fact, he talks in the in the episode about an instance where they're presenting haunted mansion stuff to Walt, and they all the all the old timers, all the veteran guys, put all the Rolly stump stuff behind Walt, right, to scare him. Walt's, no, to think oh, that's that right, Walt's that he won't see, see it. it. That's right, that's and right. And Walt sees it, and he comes in the next morning. And he says, "I was up all night because of that stuff." And Rolly gets all upset, thinking that that right. he made a man. But it, he was upset because of how impactful right. the work was. Right, right. Uh, so stories like that were were always kind of cool to mm-hmm. hear from him. So yeah. Anyway, uh, that was all we had for our Disney detective. Mm-hmm. We'll be right back with our tales from the edge of the galaxy. I was going to say insightful picks, but I'm jumping a gun. There. Yep, not there yet. We'll be back with our tales from the edge of the galaxy. <laughs> For over seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. Go for Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy. So our first story for our Star Wars section comes uh, from, hmm, I don't know. I don't know. Is that? Deseret.com. Deseret.com. Sure, we'll go with that. Um, So it talks about how we finally learned how Palpatine survived and returned in Rise of Skywalker. So Star Wars Rise of Skywalker came out about two years ago. And since then, most people have been wondering how the heck did Palpatine survive his dramatic death in Return of the Jedi only to return in Rise of Skywalker. So now, thanks to a blog post on StarWars.com, we have a, I guess, official explanation of how it happened. So how did he survive his death? Palpatine was worried about losing his power, so he con- he created the Contingency, which was a plan that would help him reclaim the Empire if he was ever killed. So the contingency started with Operation Cinder, which included Sentinel droids droids destroying Imperial and New Republic locations that held sensitive information. So when Palpatine died, his consciousness was transferred to a clone 
on the planet Exe- Exegol, Exegol uh, where he had been previously studying immortality. However, the body was too weak to hold his consciousness. So they built more clones that could be a stronger vessel for him. This is actually what they said um, led to Snoke's creation. So Snoke was made to lead the First Order, which would then work to bring Rey who we found out was Palpatine's granddaughter <laughs> to Palpatine since she could act at a, as a vessel to contain Palpatine's consciousness. So this led to the cinematic battle between Rey and Palpatine as seen in Rise of Skywalker. Palpatine fought his granddaughter to make sure that he could use her body as a vessel, but then Rey aligned with all the Jedi looking to stop him, and there you go. So, what happened? So, it's a little confusing and kind of hard to explain, and obviously they really didn't explain any of that in the movie, so that's why most people were going, huh? But it seems that in... Um, some of the novelizations of Rise of Skywalker, they talk a little bit more about it, how there were these uh, vials with liquid and that, you know, one was kind of completely empty and Kylo Ren kind of looked at it and he's, you know, studying, you know, that, that he had studied um, the Clone Wars and that the liquid flowing into this living nightmare before him was fighting a losing battle and that it was the, you know, the Emperor's, you know, flesh that was trying to be created. So in the book, I guess they actually went a little bit more into it. They just didn't do it in the movies. Um, so it seems that Palpatine's return was kind of always... In the books for the final Star Wars saga film, uh, director J.J. Abrams had actually said that there were always plans to bring back Emperor Palpatine during Rise of Skywalker. Um, and that when you look at this as nine chapters of the story, perhaps the weirder thing would be that Palpatine didn't return. Or the weirder thing would be, what if he didn't even return? Um, and Abrams had said, just look... Uh, at what he talks about, who he is, how important he is, what his story is. Tra- strangely, his absence entirely from the third trilogy would be conspicuous. Kind of where... like Luke's absence <laughs> from the first movie of the trilogy was conspicuous. <laughs> yeah, so I think if we didn't see Palpatine again, it would have been okay. I, I don't think they really needed to bring him back. But So normally I take my, my time on the soapbox here to, to bust... Disney for being Disney. Okay. In this case here, I'm going to bust Disney for trying to be Star Wars. So okay. there's some – so if you look at the original trilogy. Okay. There's history between A New Hope and Empire Strikes Back, and there's mm-hmm. history between Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. Now, none of that history is played out except for references. For instance – there's this one particular reference where Han Solo says that he has to leave in the beginning of the movie when they're on Hoth. And he makes reference to the bounty hunter on Ord Mantell. Well, nobody knows what that story was if you didn't read the novels. However, when you talk about having a death mark on you and you talk about a bounty hunter that you ran into on some other planet, you can put two and two together and you don't need to read that backstory. Mm. With this, what happened was is they wanted to have all that backstory in place. The problem was they dribbled it out over multiple types of sources. So they talk about Project Cinder. Well, Project Cinder and these Sentinel droids happen to come from a storyline from Battlefront 2. Well, how many people are watching a movie or playing a game? Right. Not many. Right. Then you talk about the clones and you talk about Palpatine's, you know, trying to get in the... Well, the, the whole idea of this contingency plan played out in the novels. So who read all the novels that watched a movie? A small percentage of the people. Mm-hmm. So what happens is you get to the movie. Now Disney assumes, well, everybody knows the story now, so we don't need to make those clear-cut references to that history that we just built. Mm. Let's just continue telling the story. And you tell the story and it's fragmented and it's disjointed and you're jumping all over the place and you have all these pieces that don't fit together because you told your story somewhere else and you didn't even make reference to it here. 
you just assumed everybody walked into this movie and knew what it was. Right. And it turned into be an absolute disaster of storytelling where you didn't need to do all that detail. You didn't need to do all that story behind it. All you have to do is have references. I'm almost okay having Palpatine be the bad guy. And I'll tell you why. Why? Because in the Star Wars MMO, Star Wars The Old Republic, there is an occurrence of an emperor. And that emperor happens to use various types of technology and Sith rituals and, and the Force and all this stuff to extend his life hundreds and thousands of years. He's resurrected himself. He's renamed himself. He's reinvented himself over and over on at least three occasions within that storyline alone. Okay. Now, for those who do keep up on the expanded universe stuff, there's this concept of these beings called celestials. Not celestials from Marvel Universe, although it'd be a cool tie-in to that and be a great gateway to that. Hint, hint, Disney. So you have these beings that came before all the other beings in the universe, in the galaxy, and then they evolved and they moved on. Well, the storyline is leaning in uh, the Old Republic that this particular emperor happened to be the entity or the essence of one of these celestials. So it would fit perfectly in that this guy somehow gets defeated in the old Republic goes dormant or something like that. And then turns out that it's Palpatine who is that same emperor who's trying to resurrect everything again. So okay. they, they didn't want the storyline from the old Republic to be canon, but that storyline would have fed perfectly into mm. the sequel trilogy to explain how this guy who was thrown down this pit on this space station that blew up and fell out of orbit is still alive. Gotcha. Because apparently he can do transfer essence across the galaxy. Mm. That's a little hard to believe. Now, I could understand if you transfer your essence to Ray, who's right in front of you. Mm. But apparently he couldn't even do that when he was able to transfer to, to another body that was all the way across the galaxy. Right, right. So it's hard to believe the way that they brought him back. But had they done it right, I would have bought it. The fact that you have Ray as his granddaughter makes no sense whatsoever. You right. didn't need him because Anakin was supposed to be that vessel that he was supposed to transfer herself into. Uh -huh. Because the one book that is canon, the Sidious book, talks about Sidious and his former master, Plagueis, who he learned how to preserve life from. They got together, performed a Sith ritual, and basically conceived Anakin from the Force. Mm. So he was, that's why his okay. goofy midichlorians were so high because he was pure Force. Mm. He was supposed to be the vessel that they were going to pour themselves into. So when he gets killed, he's not there anymore. So now they invent a granddaughter that he somehow had at some point in time a son somewhere, and that son had a kid. With someone else, and the son's not pure force, and the wife wasn't pure force, and the kid's less pure force. Like, it makes no sense. It just, it doesn't work what they tried to do with it. Okay. So, but the fact that they just decided to resurrect him because they couldn't come up with a better guy. And the fact that they wasted their time making Snoke out in two movies to be the ultimate bad guy. And then they just offed him because they were done with the, the right. character. Right, right. That was that was almost as bad as them killing off Darth Maul in the first prequel trilogy movie. You're still bitter about that. Well, and then they brought him back. So right. is Snoke really dead? I mean, they cut Maul in half. They cut Snoke in half. Is, True. is Snoke really dead? No, probably not. He's so, in a jar somewhere. He'll, yeah, he'll be back in an animated <laughs> version somewhere with spider legs. <laughs> with spider legs. Anyway. Oh, that's awesome. That's my soapbox. Okay. So let's talk about something that's going to get me less worked up, but equally as annoyed. Okay, so from ScreenRant.com, it seems that Andor, the Star Wars show, has reportedly wrapped filming. So Disney Plus's upcoming Star Wars spinoff show, Andor, has reportedly wrapped filming. The show will serve as a prequel to the 2016 film Rogue One and will follow the story of Cassian Andor uh, during his early years 
in the Rebellion Alliance. Little known is about the show's plot or characters apart from a brief uh, sizzle reel that was shown late last year, which teased that the show would be kind of a spy thriller. In universe, Cassian's history is obviously kind of tragic. Uh, as he reveals uh, to Jin in Rogue One, his struggle against the Empire was a lifelong one. Uh, he first came into conflict with Palpatine's war machine during the Clone Wars when he was just six years old, when the Empire was still referred to as the Galactic Republic. Throughout the course of the film, his uh, Machiavelli, uh, the ends justify the means philosophy, paint a picture of a man that will fight to achieve peace at any cost. With all of these ingredients in place, Andor has potential to further flesh out one of the more compelling and morally gray characters from Rogue One. A recent report from Star Wars scooper Bespin Bullet claims that filming for the show has wrapped. Uh, it seems that there were various members of production who were having their own rap parties and confirming that filming had concluded. Um, so after speaking with multiple sources, he had, uh, the, the reporter had said that it had wrapped. Uh, they had checked in with, uh, Pinewood Studio sources and that it looked like on August 18th, they were still kind of filming some things. Uh, but by the 20th, most things had, had pretty much finished up. Uh, Andor sets itself apart from other Disney Plus Star Wars spinoff shows uh, that were actually filmed are lo on location rather than using the VR volume uh, set, which was used for Book of Boba Fett, The Mandalorian, and the upcoming Obi-Wan Kenobi series. So because they were doing a lot of shots outside, obviously there were set leaks from Andor um, that People were were passing around on the internet trying to figure out what it was going to be. Um, there were some some uh, uh, trooper variants and some imperial things that people have seen. So again, we'll have to see. So compared to other upcoming Star Wars shows, the hype and interest in Andor seems to be tempted at best, which is kind of where you are. Uh, this is despite Rogue One being a critical and commercial success for Lucasfilms. That said, Cassian is considered one of the better characters in that movie, thanks to his moral uh, ambiguity painting of the rebellion in a darker light. But it's worth remembering that the Bad Batch earned mixed reactions following its initial announcement, yet the show has more than justified its existence uh, with arguably one of the strongest first seasons of Star Wars animation. So we'll see. Yeah, so I know you're not excited about it. The problem that I have here is that Rogue One, and I love the movie. Mm -hmm. I really did. I thought it was great. It was shot well. It was acted well. Mm -hmm. It was a fantastic story. It did a great handoff. Rogue One was supposed to be essentially a prequel to A New Hope. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I can buy that. So I, I finally know how Princess Leia got the plans. Right. I didn't need to. It didn't do anything for the overall story arc. Right. But now I know. So this is a prequel to the prequel. And it's a character who was basically a carbon copy of Han Solo. Down to the point that they even dressed him like Han Solo. So I don't understand why we need an origin story for Cassie and Andor. Who's dead. Who's dead. You know where his story goes. <laughs> You know what his contribution to the overall story was. Mm -hmm. Knowing what he did before that is completely irrelevant. Mm -hmm. You have a character who is morally ambiguous. You have, and here we go again with the the hints of why he's like that because mm -hmm. of his experience since he's been involved since he was six. Mm -hmm. That's all you need to know. You don't need to know. You know, you knew that hand shot first. That scene defined hand. This scene in Rogue One where he shoots his informant and, and uses that as an, an opportunity to escape defines him as a character. The way that he portrayed that character defines the character. 
you go back and you do a prequel and you try to explain that character further, you're going to dilute the character and you're going to diminish that character. Now, if they shoot it and they do a story as good as they did Rogue One, that's great. You know, regardless, I'm going to wind up watching it. Mm -hmm. But Disney needs to come up with better stories. They need to come up with original <coughs> stories. I'll even give you the Bad Batch because the Bad Batch is bridging that gap between Clone Wars and A New Hope. It's telling you that story. It's it's filling in the blanks that people want to know. Mm -hmm. Star Wars now has this huge gap between Reven Return of the Jedi and Force Awakens that for some reason Disney doesn't want to touch. You're getting little hints of it from The Mandalorian, but you're mm -hmm. only looking five years in the future. Right. You're not looking more than that. You've got a 30-year gap there. Mm -hmm. And they're doing absolutely nothing to tell you about the stuff that got you to their last three big movies. Right. They're basically going back further right. ahead and not where right. they should be. Right. In that so, sense, yeah, they're they're doing they're going about the storytelling the wrong way. People are desperate to get like where the hell did the first order come from? They mm -hmm. still haven't explained that. They hint it to it in some of the novels, but nobody's going to read the novels. Mm -hmm. You're going to have three percent of the people read the novels, mm -hmm. and that would help for Disney at least bridging the gap of Star Wars Galaxy's Edge. Exactly. Why are we worried about the First Order? Where's Darth Vader? Where's yep. all these, you know, okay, Kylo Ren, all right, whatever, but how did we They want to hinge to their here? entire Star Wars property on the on the sequel trilogy, but they seem very hesitant mm -hmm. to get you to that trilogy. To, to how to, it's there. I yeah. have... I feel I have no investment whatsoever in that new trilogy. Mm -hmm. The characters that they introduce there are completely paper characters that have no meaning to me whatsoever. Ray is a Jedi. Okay, great. What's she going to do now? We don't know. She turned into lightsabers and she moved on. Like, like that makes no sense. <laughs> you had Finn that you were setting up as a Jedi because he was force sensitive. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden he's not force sensitive anymore. Nobody cares that he's force sensitive. <laughs> He's just there. Hi, Finn. You've got you've got Poe, oh. who you completely threw away in Last Jedi, and he comes back and he kind of does stuff, and he can fly again all of a sudden. And, and it's like <laughs> they stuff. gave you nothing to be invested in these characters. Right? People were far more worried about Carrie Fisher showing up in in Rise of Skywalker and what she did. They were more invested in Laura Dern's character. Who nobody liked, but she sacrificed herself. You know, they were they were more concerned about Akbar, but you just spaced him. You you just killed him off, and nobody you didn't get to see anything with him. It's a twap. And it's like <laughs> I, I don't understand what they're like. Like Disney is a storytelling company, mm -hmm. and they're doing a terrible job. You look at what they do with Marvel. Marvel is a fantastic. Fantastic mm -hmm. storytelling thing. By the way, uh, Kevin Feige did come out and announce he's doing, he's producing, he's co producing a Star Wars movie with Kathleen Kennedy, and Han Solo is not going to be in the movie. Apparently, there was some speculation that Han Solo was going to show up in whatever movie he was doing. But he's dead. Well, so is Darth Maul. And Darth Maul's back too, so. True. Okay. Yeah. And mm. Obi Wan's dead, and he's back, and Cassian's dead, and he's back. So okay, gotcha. Death in the Star Wars universe doesn't really mean it's like dead. a soap opera. Exactly, exactly. You you look different. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, you done? I'm Are you done, done ranting? I am done. This was a Star Wars rant this week. Phew! So we'll be right back with our <laughs> entertainment news of the week. Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Talking to real teens about real teen problems. Explore issues from braces to puberty, social anxiety to financial responsibility. Each week, we talk about the topics concerning today's youth. We look at how the issues affect teens, how to cope with these issues, and how parents, friends, and loved ones can help teens handle these challenges. 
check out our video episodes on youtube.com backslash insights into things. Catch our audio versions on podcast.insightsintoteens.com or on the web at insightsintothings.com. Go for entertainment news. So Spencer Eldon, the man who was photographed as a baby on the album cover for Nirvana's Nevermind, is actually suing the band, alleging sexual exploitation. So the cover depicts Eldon as a four-month-old in a swimming pool, grasping for a dollar bill that's being dangled in front of him on a fishing line. Now 30, Eldon says his parents never signed a release authorizing the use of his image on the album. He also alleges that the nude image constitutes child pornography. Uh, these images expose Spencer's intimate part body parts and displays his genitals from the time he was an infant to present day, says his uh, legal papers that were filed in California. So non-sexualized photos of infants are generally not considered child pornography under U.S. law. However, his his attorney argues that uh, in the inclusion of the dollar bill, which was superimposed after the photograph was taken, makes the minor seem like a quote unquote sex worker. Um the legal case also alleges that Nirvana had promised to cover his genitals with a sticker, but the agreement was never upheld. Eldon alleges that his true identity and legal name are forever tied to this commercial sexual exploitation he experienced as a minor, which has been distributed and sold worldwide from the time he was a baby to the present day. He claims that he has suffered and will continue to suffer lifelong damages as a result of the artwork, including extreme and permanent emotional distress, as well as interference with his normal development and educational progress and medical and psychological treatment. So he is now asking for damages for uh, of at least $150,000 from each of the 15 defendants who include the two surviving band members, uh, the managers of Kurt Cobain's estate, Cobain's former wife, Courtney Love, and the photographer, uh, Kirk well, uh, Weedle. Uh, representatives for Nirvana and the their record label have not yet responded to the claims. Uh, Eldon has recreated the album cover several times as a teenager and adult, always wearing swimming trunks uh, to mark Nevermind's 10th, 20th, and 25th anniversaries. However, he has sometimes expressed ambivalence about the photo shoot. So back in 2016, he actually told Time magazine that he had got a little upset about the notoriety as he grew up. He said, I just woke up already being a part of this huge project. It's pretty difficult. You feel like you're famous for nothing. It's hard not to get upset when you hear how much money was involved. Um, and then you go to a baseball game and you think about it. Man, everybody at this game has probably seen my little baby penis. <laughs> and you kind of feel that, you know, his human rights were were revoked. But then in under, other interviews uh, that he did, he was kind of more upbeat about the image. So at one point he had said, it's always been a positive thing and open doors for me. And this he had told Guardian, uh, the Guardian about six years ago. He had said, I was 23 and an artist. And it the story actually gave me an opportunity to work with uh, Shepard Fairley uh, for five years. And he was a huge music connoisseur. So when he heard that I was the Nirvana baby, he thought it was really cool. And then back in 2008, his father had recounted that the photo shoot um, for the photo shoot to U.S. radio network NPR, uh, that they were actually offered two hundred dollars by the. A uh, photographer who was actually a family friend, and they basically had had this huge pool party. No one had any idea what was going on, and the family quickly forgot about the photo shoot until three months later when they saw the Nevermind album cover blown up on the wall 
of Tower Records in Los Angeles. Um, two months after the NPR article, uh, Griffin Records had sent the one-year-old Spencer a platinum album and a teddy bear. Um, the album, which included the hit Smells Like Teen Spirit, Come As You Are, and Lithium, went to sell on 30 million copies around the world. So I'm not a lawyer or a legal scholar. I don't scholar, play one on TV. <laughs> and, nor do I play one on TV. Uh, but I can't help but think if you looked up frivolous lawsuit in the dictionary, this guy's face would be right next to it. Mm -hmm. Right next to his baby penis. Um, <laughs> this is ridiculous because it was okay for him to exploit his notoriety. Because I'll tell you, you have no idea who that baby is. Absolutely. And you wouldn't know anything about who that baby is if he hadn't exploited it himself. Right. So apparently the gravy train has run out on his ability to exploit this. Right. So now he's going to complain about it and, and say his rights were violated and try to get more money out of it. And right. that's his next phase of exploitation of this. Right. Especially if you've never gone and recreated this. Right. But you did it. Multiple times. 10 year, 20 year. Just five years ago right. on the 25th well, and probably anniversary. what happened was he realized, well, you know, I didn't get nearly as much money for the 25-year right. one that I thought I was going to get. Yeah. I'm not going to get anywhere near what I want for the 30-year. So let me sue now. Right. And I'm sorry, but once you've taken advantage of this mm -hmm. and exploited it and used it for your own gain, you've you've given up any right you have to sue on it at this right. point in time. Right. I think they should go through with the lawsuit. And when he loses, he should pay the defendant's legal fees. Mm. And this is why you need tort reform in this country, so that you don't have stupid, frivolous lawsuits like this. Yep. On to a sadder note. Yeah, so continuing with some music news, but very sad music news. Charlie Watts, the self-effacing uh, and unshakable Rolling Stones drummer who helped anchor one of rock's greatest rhythm sections and used his day job to support his enduring love of jazz, had passed away, according to his publicist. And he was 80 years old. Uh, his publicist said on Tuesday that Watts passed away peacefully in a London hospital, hospital earlier today, surrounded by his family. Charlie was a cherished husband, father, and grandfather, who also uh, and was also a member of the Rolling Stones, one of the greatest drummers of his genera generation. Watts had announced that he would not go on the world tour in uh, with the Stones in 2022 because of an undefined health issue. The quiet, elegantly dressed Watts had often ranked with Keith Moon, Ginger Baker, and a handful of others as a premier rock drummer, uh, respected worldwide for his muscular swinging style as the Stones rose from their scruffy beginnings to international stardom. He joined the band early in 1963 and remained for nearly 60 years, ranked just behind Mick Jagger and Keith Richards as the group's longest lasting and most essential members. He stayed on and largely held to him, uh, held himself apart through the drug abuse, creative clashes and ego wars that helped kill founding member Brian Dro Jones drove bassist Bill Wyman and Joe's, Jones's replacement, Mick Taylor, to quit and otherwise made being in the Stones a most exhausting job. A classic Stones song like Brown Sugar and Start Me Off uh, Start Me Up often begin with a hard guitar riff from Richard, with Watts slowly closing behind with Wyman as the bassist, likely to say, fattening up the sound. Uh, Watts' speed, power, and timekeeping were never better showcased than during the concert documentary Shine a Light, when director Martin Scorsese filmed Jumping Jack Flash from where he drummed towards the back of the stage. Uh, the Stones began, Watts said, as black as white blokes from England playing black American music, but quickly evolved their own distinctive sound. Watts was actually a jazz drummer in his early years and never lost his affinity for the music he first loved, uh, heading his own jazz band and taking on numerous side projects. Um, Richard and, and Jagger at times, you know, seemed to admire him as both a man and a musician. Um, and Richards has actually 
called Watts the key and often joked that their uh, affinity was so strong that on stage, he sometimes tried to rattle him by suddenly changing the beat, only to have Watts just kind of change it back. Um, Watts also found refuge from the rock life by marrying Shirley Ann Shepard in 1964 and having a daughter, Serafina, soon after. So while other famous rock star marriages crumbled, they were together up until his passing. Yeah. Shame. He was a, he was a gentleman. He was a sharp dresser. Mm -hmm. We talk about how he was always fashion conscious. Yep. Uh, and he was always so quiet. Yes. In interviews and on stage like he never he was modest to the point that he never tried to take you know the spotlight from anybody yeah and he was very can he knew how good he was everybody else knew how good he was mm -hmm. and that was all he needed to know he yeah. did not need to be a front man he did not need to be yeah you know that guy that was out there strutting his stuff yeah and they were talking about obviously you know all the different radio stations have been talking about it, you know, the last two days and stuff. And, and they were basically saying, you know, he was one of a kind. Yeah. He, he, you know, was a rock star for so long, but yet never really lived it. He settled right. down and he had his wife, he had his daughter, he had his granddaughter, and that's what he wanted. They, they he didn't need to be being, crazy. Always looking for the next plane home. When mm -hmm. could he get home? When could he spend time with his family? Right, right. Uh, and that's that's really a tribute to the kind of man he mm -hmm. was. Yeah. Um, so it's sad. You mm -hmm. know, we will we'll miss his passing. Mm -hmm. So we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back with our insightful picks of the week. Go for your insightful pick. So my insightful pick this week is Broadway Beyond the Golden Age. Uh, it is available on PBS. Uh, it is available through streaming. And probably if you are interested and you look up PBS, your schedule, it's probably playing multiple times. Uh, it's under the Great Performances uh header. So Broadway Beyond the Golden Age explores the world of Broadway from 1959 through the early 1980s as recounted by a diverse cast of Broadway stars who lived through it, creating a first-hand archive of personal backstage stories and memories. It was written and directed and produced by the late filmmaker Rich, uh, Rick McKay and hosted by two-time award uh, Tony Award winning Tony Award nominee, Jonathan Groff. Uh, the new documentary is a long-awaited sequel to McKay's award-winning 2003 film, Broadway, The Golden Age, by the legends who were there. Um, so this is a follow-up to his um, original uh, oral history of Broadway, which included the 60s and 70s. Um, so it spotlights um, the Broadway show Once Upon a Mattress, uh, Bye Bye Birdie, Barefoot in the Park, Pippin, A Chorus Line, Ain't Misbehavin', Chicago, and 42nd Street. Um, so particular focus is placed on famed directors and choreographers like Bob Fosse and George Abbott and Michael Bennett um, with, you know, anecdotes from 1959's Once Upon a Mattress through 1983's When a Chorus Line became the longest running Broadway show in history. And it features a galaxy of, of stars from Alec Baldwin, uh, Carol Burnett, Glenn Close, Jane Fonda, uh, Robert Goulet, uh, Liza Minnelli, Cheetah Rivera, Dick Van Dyke, Ben Vereen, and, and so many more. And what's interesting is that they have some very rare archival photos and also never before um, footage that was shown from on stage and off stage. So, you know, they, they talk about what was really interesting was how a chorus line came to be. And they had the original cast members and, and basically the idea kind of happened because dancers were always just kind of something that went along with Broadway shows. You know, they were always the ones that worked the hardest because they had to learn all these routines and basically got no recognition. So one night, this one, Right, this this one writer and and director kind of gathered up all these different dancers from all these different shows and kind of had a party at his house and they kind of started at like eleven o'clock at night, 
And it went until noon the next morning. And basically they were just telling all their stories of how they became a dancer, what they were kind of escaping from and and what their story was of of going from one audition to another and finally getting it. And that all became what we know now as the Broadway show and what also became the movie, A Chorus Line. And and the one um, dancer actually said, if you look through, you know, the notes from the original uh, script from their party, his his dialogue is like word for word. It was his exact story. Basically, they just changed the the name of the actor. That was that was it. Um, and then it goes on that it just became such a hit, and that when they did finally become the longest running show, they did a special performance where they brought back everybody who had been in a chorus line, and. It was this like phenomenal record breaking cast that they had. So it was really cool. So if you're interested in Broadway and, you know, seeing some of this archival photo, you know, unfortunately, some of the actors have since passed away. But it's great that their oral history has been preserved and you you have them talking about how their experience was really kind of fascinating to hear these backstories of these beloved shows that, you know, have have stood the test of time. Okay, cool pick. Thank you. So my pick this week, like I said earlier, is kind of a little off the wall. Uh, This is uh, Top Secret UFO Projects Declassified. It's a six-episode series on Netflix that features interviews with experts on alien sightings and Project Blue Book, the U.S. Air Force's investigation in the UFOs that went on from the early 1950s to the late 1960s. Produced in a documentary style, the series covers reported alien events in thematic fashion, from supposedly unknown details from Project Blue Book to Soviet secrets. Using new account, news accounts, witness testimony, subject matter experts, leaked documentation, and dramatic recreations, the show attempts to depict various accounts of extraterrestrial encounters over the six-part series. Personally, I consider myself an optimistic skeptic when it comes to UFOs. I don't generally consume these types of programs to feed some search for truth or revelation. Instead, I enjoy picking out the cultural references, historical data, and general state of mind of the individuals involved in these types of accounts. Um, The interesting thing is these investigations did happen. Whether or not UFOs were found or aliens were found or any of the conclusions that are drawn within the documentation, uh, the documentary itself um, actually happened, you know, I I leave that to the viewer. But I, I enjoy the historical aspect of the U.S. Air Force devoting resources to researching these things. And to a certain extent, they don't necessarily research it from the perspective of are they aliens as much as they research it from the effect of is there an, a threat to national security? You know, all during the Cold War, the speculation was, okay, well, are the Russians developing technology that are is capable of performing the way these observations are? And the the army then goes in and says, okay, well, a lot of these incidents are focused over nuclear sites. So that's a national security uh, issue there. So there was a lot of things and and information came out from uh, released uh, Russian documents that the Soviet Union did try to capitalize to a certain extent on the alien UFO scare to try to cause mass hysteria in the U S for tactical advantage. So a lot of the stuff that's that's out there is factual information, how it's interpreted and what your conclusions are, are subjective. So top secret UFO projects declassified a six part series available on Netflix. And we'll be right back. So we're running up against the clock on this one here, but we do have some afterthoughts to give you. What do we got? Sure. So we have uh, September 11th, a free toy show, which will be at Carnival of Collectibles, which is in Sicklerville. Also hosted by to- toy show 
uh, toyshows.org is the Delaware Train Show, which will be October 9th, the Oktoberfest Toy Show, which is October 10th. Those are held in Newcastle, Delaware. Then we have RetroCon, which will be September 25th and 26th at the Greater Philadelphia Expo Center. Also that weekend in Hunts Valley, uh, Hunt Valley, Maryland is Monster Mania 47. Then a month later is Monster Mania 48, which will be at Oaks, Pennsylvania, um, October 22nd through the 24th. Then the beginning of October at the Greater Philadelphia Expo Center is Brickfest. Okay. I think that's all we had. Uh, before we go, uh, I do want to, impl- well, I just really went crazy with that <laughs> shot. You're like, what? Like, Whoa, okay. <laughs> Uh, before we go, I do want to, uh, once again, invite our audience to subscribe to the podcast. You can subscribe to the audio version of this podcast listed as insights into entertainment. Video versions of all of our podcasts are listed as insights into things. We're available on Apple podcasts, Spotify, Google stitcher, iHeartRadio, radio, tune in, et cetera, et cetera. I would also invite folks to give us your feedback, give us your shows, your local shows that we can, uh, plug for you as well uh, and tell us how we're doing. You can email us at comments at insights into things.com. You can find us on Twitter at insights underscore things on Facebook. We're at facebook.com slash insights into things podcast on Instagram at instagram.com backslash insights into things. Audio versions of this, of this podcast can be found on the web at podcast.insights in the entertainment.com. The video versions of all of our podcasts are on youtube.com backslash insights into things. And we do stream five days a week on Twitch at twitch.tv slash insights into things. And you can find us on the web if you don't remember any of our other links. All of our links can be found at our main website, which is insights into things.com. That's it. Another one in the books. Have a good week, everyone. Bye. Bye.